Hi, welcome to a quick video on Link Budget. A link budget is used to plan radio links. Specifically, what we do is we use the uh, freeze equation as a planning tool, and a link budget is simply a way to interpret the freeze equation in a manner that allows us to see the effect of the individual factors in a convenient way. So, first a reminder of what the freeze equation is. It says that the received power in a radio link depends on the transmit power, P sub t, the gain of the transmit antenna, G sub t, the gain of the receive antenna, G sub r, divided by the path loss, L sub p. And just a reminder here that when we say the gain of an antenna, we're referring to the directivity of an antenna times its efficiency. So D sub t is directivity of that transmit antenna, and epsilon sub t is the efficiency of that transmit antenna, referring to the possibility of loss within the transmit antenna. And similarly for the receive antenna, epsilon sub r times D sub r. Now what we're going to do is include some more factors. These are factors that appear as a consideration in radio link planning. So first, antenna impedance mismatch. The possibility that the antenna impedance is not equal to the output impedance of the transmitter, or the possibility that the receive antenna's impedance is not equal to the input impedance of the receiver. So you might compute this, for example, as 1 minus magnitude gamma, gamma being the reflection coefficient squared. So we represent that as being epsilon sub t and epsilon sub r, additional factors appearing in the freeze equation. Remember, these were not included in the derivation of the freeze equation, which assumed a conjugate matched uh, receiver and transmitter. There are efficiencies associated with the receive and transmit antennas. Those are represented here along with the directivity. So epsilon sub t, d sub t, epsilon sub r, d sub r, as shown here. And then, of course, there is polarization mismatch. That's another factor that was not included in the derivation of the freeze equation, but which exists. The transmit antenna generates a certain polarization in the radio wave, and as that radio wave is incident on the receive antenna, there is a mismatch if the receive antenna's polarization is not matched to the polarization of the incident wave. So we account for that as this factor epsilon sub p here. Obviously, Epsilon sub p could be anywhere between 1, which would be ideal, down to 0, which would mean a perfect mismatch. And then finally, a reminder here that path loss can have this most general form. Actually, that's not the most general form, but a very general form, in which it is a wavelength divided by 4 pi r, r being range, raised to the minus n, n being path loss exponent. Recall that n equals 2 for free space. And in general, n is uh, greater than 2, sometimes up to 5. This factor here accounting for the possibility of attenuation, typically very small in the uh, HF, VHF, UHF bands, becomes increasingly important, especially once you get into the millimeter wave region. This equation is commonly expressed in dB form. When we have a cascade of factors like this, and we convert this to dBs, of course this becomes a sum. So what we find is that 10 log 10 of the receive power is 10 log 10 of the transmit power, plus 10 log 10 of the impedance mismatch efficiency on the transmit side, plus 10 log 10 of the efficiency of the transmit antenna, and so on. So a sum of these factors. When we get down to path loss, we have 10 log 10 of uh, the path loss, and that can be further decomposed. In fact, it decomposes to three different terms. One term is 10n times log 10 of the wavelength divided by 4 pi. That expression depends only on frequency. In fact, you might say that that is the contribution of frequency to path loss. The next term that comes out is minus 10 n log 10 of r, and that's accounting for spreading, right? If n is 2, then we get 20 log 10 r, and that'd be for free space. For higher values of r, we get different leading factors there. And then the third factor is for absorption, of course. 
So now by doing this, by expressing path loss in dB, we can see individual physical contributions as separate terms in the sum. This approach allows simple algebraic tabulation, visualization if you will, of the relative effects of various radio link parameters. And this is super useful for radio link planning because now you can see for a required receive power what you have to do in terms of those individual contributions in order to achieve that. And an example follows. So here's our example. Uh, NOAA Weather Radio. This is uh, a government service which broadcasts weather information at a bunch of frequencies, but one of them is 162.475 megahertz. So that's the frequency we'll assume. A typical transmit power for a NOAA Weather Radio broadcast is one kilowatt. Uh, one kilowatt is of course also 30 dBW. That's 30 dB relative to one watt. Or you might write this as 60 dBm. That's 60 dB relative to one milliwatt. The reason we might say 60 dBm is because receiver designers tend to think in terms of dBm's, decibels relative to a milliwatt. It's a convenient unit. But all those things mean the same thing. The typical directivity of a NOAA weather radio broadcast antenna is about 8 dBi. That's achieved by using a vertical phased array of dipoles. Uh, but for all we really need to know here is that it is uh, about 8 dBi in the direction of uh, receivers. The typical directivity of a receive antenna, that is something you might have as a handheld, could be anywhere between plus 3 dBi and minus 10 dBi a pretty wide range. So just to get started here, we'll assume zero dBi, which would be a typical planning value, but we have to keep in mind that there's a large variation around this value, and we'll come back to the impact of that variation a little bit later. Path loss? Well, VHF, 162 megahertz, attenuation is negligible, so that attenuation factor, e to the 2 alpha r, is about one, we can ignore it. The frequency term, minus 10 n log 10 lambda over 4 pi. Well, we need to know the wavelength. That's just 1.85 meters for 162.475 megahertz. And we get plus 8.3 n dB. So free space, n is 2, we'd get 16.6 dB, and so on. The spreading term in path loss is plus 10 n log 10 of range. Now, if we used meters in the frequency term, we have to use meters in the uh, spreading term in order to be consistent. So that'd be 10 n log 10 r in meters specifically in order to be consistent. Then the remaining factors, transmit, antenna, and peen mismatch. That's usually easy to make good at the transmitter. That can be designed to be very close to 1, so 0 dB would be a good assumption. The efficiency of the transmit antenna, again, at the transmitter, it's pretty easy to make that very, very close to 1, so that'll be about 0 dB to a good approximation. The impedance mismatch at the receive antenna, it's hard to make that uh, exactly 1. There's a whole bunch of reasons why the impedance of the receive antenna might vary. For example, proximity of the receive antenna to other things, like, for example, your head, could change the impedance of the antenna. So a planning value here might be minus 3 dB, as I've done here. The efficiency of the receive antenna, again, this could vary, but um, it's a pretty reasonable assumption to say it's close to 1, that is 0 dB, for something like an external monopole um, at resonance. For other types of antennas, it would be more difficult, but this is not a bad assumption, as long as we remember that it could vary. And again, we'll address that a little bit later. And then polarization efficiency, the effect of polarization mismatch. You know, we can't assume that a handheld antenna is going to be perfectly aligned with the incident wave. We just can't assume that. So there is going to be some mismatch. A typical value might be minus 3 dB. We might be lucky, and it might be close to zero. We might be unlucky, it might be much less. And we'll just have to keep in mind that variation. But minus 3 dB for a planning value just to get started.
Okay, now we're ready to do a link budget. Uh, in this link budget, we're going to fix the range. We'll say the range is 10 kilometers. So for example, in actual planning, this might be the maximum range that you are assuming for coverage by this radio station. So I'll assume R equals 10 kilometers. So now I can start computing parameters as long as I know one more thing, and that's the path loss exponent. There are really two possibilities. One is that we've got free space propagation, n equals 2. That's a little bit unrealistic in this scenario. At this frequency range for the antenna heights we're talking about, you should know that it's not really reasonable to assume free space. A far more likely scenario is you've got something more like the ground bound scenario, which is closer to n equals 4. So I'll show you the difference there, but the more likely scenario is that we have uh, n something like 4. So now we can compute parameters. For P sub t, we get plus 60 dBm, as I pointed out before. D sub t, plus 8 dBi, as I pointed out before. For path loss, that appears in the denominator of the freeze equation, so we're subtracting this. Minus 16.6 .6 dB for frequency, minus 80 dB for the range effect. And we see, as expected, that the effect of path loss is pretty big, 80 dB compared to 60 dB or 8 dBi. Note that the sum of these things is the path gain. Path loss and path gain are reciprocal quantities, so they have opposite signs when you express them in dB. So you just have to be very careful about the signs and uh, make sure you have the right ones. If I take all the other factors, a to sub t, epsilon sub t, epsilon sub p, d sub r, epsilon sub r, a to sub r, those are things I had some uncertainty about. But if I multiply them all together in dB, they become minus 6 dB. So that's what I'm currently using as a planning value. In free space, I find the received power is, is simply the sum of all these terms. I get minus 34.6 dBm. That would be the power delivered to the receiver. The problem is that that's not realistic, as I pointed out. It's not realistic to assume free space at this particular wavelength, that is frequency, and at this particular range. If I go to the ground bounce case, which is probably more realistic, well, the effective transmit power stays the same, the effective transmit directivity stays the same. Uh, what changes is the path loss. So the frequency term in path loss goes to minus 33.2 dB. It's twice as much in dB. And the distance effect, that is the spreading effect, goes to minus 160 dB from minus 80 dB. And that's an enormous difference. But that's realistic to assume. So just by writing out the freeze equation in this manner, in the algebraic manner, we can see pretty clearly that path loss is a huge problem here. The other terms would stay the same. There's no n contribution to any of those terms. And when we add all these up, we now get minus 131.2 dB. So that's a huge difference from what we get when we assumed free space propagation. But that's the reasonable planning value. Now, the next logical question to ask would be, what is the minimum received power? In other words, how much power do I need at the receiver in order to reliably demodulate the signal? We refer to that as the sensitivity of a receiver. And I'll tell you that the typical sensitivity of a NWR receiver would be something like, and this, again, this is just a typical value, is minus 129 dBm. In other words, it's reasonable to assume that a typical NWR receiver would be able to demodulate a signal at minus 129 dBm with reasonable audio quality. Well, you'll notice that minus 129 dBm is greater than minus 131.2 dBm. Properly, that should be shown as dBm. If I subtract these two quantities, I find out that I've got a deficit of 2.2 dB. In other words, the signal which I anticipate receiving is about 2 dB below the sensitivity of the receiver. We refer to this deficit as, uh, as link margin. Link margin less than 0 dB means that the link is not closed. When we say not closed, we mean that doesn't meet the sensitivity requirement for the receiver. So if this number is negative, 
that means that we have a deficit. We would need to either increase power or decrease range. Well, typically you would not be able to decrease range, right? You're designing for a certain coverage area. You would probably need to increase power, right? So that would be an indication of how much greater than one kilowatt you would require at the transmitter. Alternatively, you would need to find some other place. For example, maybe you increase the directivity of the antenna. That's a more expensive antenna system. In any event, you now know what you have to do to close the link, and you know the contribution that those various actions are going to have. Finally, I'll note that you can't simply design for a link margin of zero. Sure, a link margin of zero will close the link, but it's dangerous. It's dangerous here because of the uncertainty that we have in this remaining term that we indicated here. The sum of all these terms we came up with as being minus 6 dBi, but some of these terms had variations on the order of a few dB, maybe up to 10 dB. So really, we would want the link margin to be more like 10 dB, or maybe 15 dB, or maybe 20 dB, depending on how reliable we want this link to be. So it is common to specify link margin to be, again, 10 dB or 20 dB. For sure, it should be larger than the uncertainty you have in various parameters. So again, this illustrates the utility of link budget analysis. That concludes this lecture on link budget.